Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Shadows Podcast. I'm your host, Trip Bodenheimer, and I am joined today by my co host, Caleb Pearson. Pearson, what's going on? I'm all right, man. How are you doing? Pretty good. I just finished up a few moments ago teaching a uh, Five Voices, Five Gears session for uh, the Co Colorado Air National Guard. So it was, uh, it was really cool getting to, to interact with them. How's your day been? Oh, nice. That's awesome. Really getting your voice out there. Uh, it's been good. Um, did uh, some pretty good cardio and a good workout today. And I'm feeling good, feeling energized. And I'm very excited about what's uh, about what's about to happen. So yeah, this has been one of those uh, guests that we've circled on our schedule. We're very excited for us as active duty military members. Super humbling experience just to have some time on his schedule to spend here with us today. He is the fifth Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Bob Gaylor. He is here with us. Sir, welcome to Shadows Podcast. Yeah, thank you very much, Caleb and Tripp. It's great to be with you. I'm looking forward to some good interaction. Oh, this is, this is going to be fun. I, I don't yes, think any sir. of us are a loss for words. So, <laughs> uh, Pearson, you want to start first with the first rapid fire? All right, sir. So I just have a quick question for you. If you were to be an automobile, what automobile would you be? It can be from any time, any era. What automobile would you be and why? I would be a, a Ford Mustang because... Uh, it's a 1966 model because it's a beautiful car. It's fast, had a lot of get up and go. It was very popular when it came out in 1966. And because I have one sitting in my garage, I've owned it for uh, 42 years and, and I get a lot of thumbs up when I drive it. So I, uh, I'm the Ford Mustang guy, 1966 vintage. That's fitting. That is perfect, sir. <laughs> All right, sir. My question for you is you can refer one leadership book to somebody. What book would that be? Leadership book. Oh, book. Uh, you know, the one that uh, influenced me the most in, uh, in the early 70s, Hersey and Blanchard, Paul Hersey and Ken Blanchard wrote wrote a book, uh, The Management of Organizational Behavior. But uh, the great thing about their book was they, they uh, included the works of at least 15 or 20 different leadership experts of that era. And so you got a, a thumbnail sketch of the great works of the gurus of that time. And so it, uh, if you were to see my book at my house, you would see it's dog-eared from the many times that I, I've referred to it. You know, if you read David McClellan's book, you get David McClellan. But in this book by Hersey and Blanchard, they did Lickard and McClellan and, and uh, Hertzberg and, and Maslow and all the gurus of that time that are now in... in uh, in old books, but I'm talking about in the early 70s. And that was when I had become a student of leadership. And so that was a great influence on me. Um, I, I, any book on leadership, there are thousands, of course, and any good book on leadership, I think you have to read a whole bunch of them. I've, I've read Schwarzkopf, the Desert Storm guy. I've read Chuck Yeager. I've read Kurt LeMay, the Strategic Air Command uh, uh, guy. I even read Bill Russell, coach of the Boston Celtics. I, I've been looking for an answer to a question. What is it that great leaders do that make them great? Mm. What, what, what are things that great leaders do that make them great? I've always had a fascination to find an answer to that question. So I, I read a lot of books on leadership. Anything by Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly does a great job. The yeah. uh, Killing series, Killing Love those. Kennedy, Killing Reagan. Those are, are great. He's got a great researcher on his staff. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for surviving the rapid fire questions that we, we threw out there at you. Now we're going to uh, celebrate all the amazing things that you've accomplished. And first thing, you were born, am I pronouncing this right? Bellevue, Iowa? 
Yeah, right, right on the Mississippi River. I was born a block from the river. Uh, it's right south of Dubuque, Iowa, a uh, big city. Bellevue only had a couple thousand people. And I was born there in 1930. And uh, yeah, and I grew up during the Depression. When I was nine, 1939, we moved to Indiana. And so I, I sort of consider myself more of a Hoosier than a Hawkeye. But I started in Bellevue and I uh, then Indiana. And then you went to, was it uh, Lafayette, Indiana? Well, Lafayette is the where Purdue University is. The town where I grew up was Mulberry, had fewer than a thousand people. There were 18 in my graduating class, wow. 12 girls, six boys. And they have since, there were 11 schools in our county. There's now four. So they consolidated a lot of schools. But back in the 40s, there were a lot of small schools. And so I went to uh, Mulberry High School. Lafayette is where I had to go to see the recruiter. OK, and you mentioned the recruiter. Uh, you entered the Air Force in September 1948. What made you join the Air Force? I, you know what is interesting? I asked young airmen today at Lackland Basic Training, why did you join? And our reasons are exactly the same. Really? Really. Uh, uh, here, in no particular order. I wanted to get away from home and grow up. I wanted independence and to see if I could make it on my own. I wanted to travel and see uh, the world. I wanted to learn a skill. I had a patriotic uh, itch that I needed scratching. I wanted to serve my country. I was in, influenced as a young man by World War II, and I wanted to do my bit. So travel, learning a skill, getting away from home, I find that uh, you probably joined for at least some of those same reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, just to sort of go out on your own. Uh, college was out of the question because there, there were no scholarships then. And uh, I, we sure couldn't afford it. Uh, I was one of eight kids or eight. I had four brothers and sisters. So the Air Force seemed like the, uh, the logical step. Um, I, uh, at that time trip, they had a three-year enlistment. Uh, you could join, you know, they had, uh, believe it or not, they had three choices, three years or one year active with a five year reserve commitment, or believe it or not, they had an indefinite enlistment where could, where you could, uh, join on an indefinite status and uh, they stopped doing that, uh, about a year after I was in, but. I came in on a three-year enlistment. Okay. And because it, it's kind of uh, interesting looking back at when you joined in September in 1948, because that was still kind of the infancy of the Air Force. And then here today, we're kind of in the infancy stages um, of the Space Force. So you, you came in, you were assigned to the security police career field. Uh, what was it like as a brand new airman Gaylor? I, uh, uh, believe it or not, it was uh, common to leave Lackland not knowing your career field. Mm. I went home on 10 day leave to show off my new uniform and people asked me, what are you going to be doing? I, I said, I have no idea. When we left Lackland with orders for our assignment, uh, we were told upon arrival, report to personnel and they will select a career field for you based on the need of the base at that time. So I left uh, Lackland with orders for Waco Air Base, Waco, Texas. And I went home on Indiana on leave. And if you can imagine, I reported in at Waco on 23 December, two days before Christmas, PFC Gaylor with my one stripe, uh, and everything I owned in my duffel bag. And I uh, rode the train from Indiana back to Waco and as instructed, reported in the personnel and a two-striper at that time called Corporal. He said to me, um, 
uh, Gaylor, you're lucky. He said, we can actually offer you three choices. He said, usually we just assign people, but he said, you can be a cook, firefighter, or military policeman. And at that time, none of those three uh, uh, excited me. And I must have, have delayed because he said, hey, come on, Gaylor, I don't have all day. Pick one or I'll pick one for you. Now, you talk about a sophisticated assignment system. That's it. <laughs> and so I just blurted out, okay, MP. He wrote a name on a small piece of paper and a building number and said, report to so-and-so at that building next. He was through with me. And uh, I can remember dragging my duffel bag across the playground with a piece of paper in my hand, uh, thinking, what just happened? Uh, if you can imagine without any training, I guarded uh, the finance building from one in the morning till five in the morning, Christmas morning. I can still hear the chimes on the base flagpole clanging yep. in, in the wind. And I had a weapon that I had never fired and I had no training. All I knew were my general orders to walk my post in a military manner, keeping always on the alert. And uh, that was all I had to go by. All I know is if you had come on, I'd have probably shot you because I was, <laughs> I was vigilant and alert. I was serving my Air Force as a military policeman. Uh, we wore a black and white armband that said MP, and uh, we became air police in the summer of 49. And we went to a blue and tangerine armband that said air police. We didn't get our shield until 1956. Hmm. So the first seven years I wore a, a, a brassard, it was called a brassard, an armband. The, um, in, in April 1st of 1949, I'd been in the Air Force seven months, they promoted me to corporal. Just, I didn't meet a board or anything. One day they just called me and said, you're now a corporal. And so I, I went from $72 a month to 80. I got an $8 pay raise with my second stripe. Uh, in uh, late April, they called me and they said, Gaylor, you appear to be motivated and, and uh, keeping your record clean. We have one quota for military police school at Fort Gordon, Augusta, Georgia and we've selected you to attend. And I remember feeling so honored. Can you imagine now, I rode a Victory Trailway bus from Waco, Texas to Augusta, Georgia, through the deep south, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, in 1949 in May. And this young kid from Mulberry, Indiana, who had never, ever, ever seen a sign that said colored water fountain, colored back of the bus, colored eat here. I had never seen that. That was an education unto itself. I was wide eyed, confused, and uh, pick out any word you want. I, wow. And uh, I had a buddy at, uh, at uh, Fort at Columbus, uh, Alabama at the base there. I think it was Lawson Air Force Base. And I stopped there on the way to visit him, and then went on to Augusta. Six week course taught by the Army. Uh, so, boy. And you know, I got back, uh, Corporal Gaylor, on July 1st, with nine months' service, was promoted to Buck Sergeant. So, after nine months' service, I had three strikes. Wow. Pearson, you uh, you got one? Yes, sir, I do. Um, so you were talking about you traveled uh, in the deep south. Um, that 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 brings up a good question for me as far as your experience with uh, like diversity and inclusion um, from that era to to today. Uh, can you talk to us about 
um, how you dealt with or experienced uh, maybe segregation, desegregation during those times, and maybe compare that to what's going on in today's uh, Air Force or today's service? I, uh, <clears throat> I was born in Bellevue, Iowa. And to the best of my knowledge, there were no blacks living there. We moved to Rossville, Indiana. I lived there four years, 627 people, the sign said on the outskirts of the city. Uh, there were no black people there. Mulberry, Indiana, where we moved to in 43, there were no black people. Uh, I was 18 years old when I joined the Air Force and I had never talked one-on-one -on -one with a black person or an Asian person, or anyone of, of uh, any other race, creed, or color. Uh, when I arrived at Lackland, the first thing I found out was the Air Force was still segregated. I could not understand that. If you had asked me why, I could not have explained it. It confused me. My thinking was, we're all in the same Air Force. Why don't we live and train together? I simply could not understand that it was foreign to me. When I arrived at Waco Air Base, one of the first things I learned was the Black Airmen lived over by gate two. They had five dormitories. They had their own dining hall. They had their own vehicle pool. They had their own guardhouse. And uh, so they lived separate and apart, and I lived in a segregated barracks. Okay, so I was a cop, and a couple of times I'd drive base patrol, and during patrol, I would drive over into the black area, and there would be a black military policeman patrolling, and we'd pull our Jeeps up beside one another, and I'd say, hi, my name is Bob. And he said, hi, I'm Tom Farmer. And I said, it's good to know you, Tom. Where are you from? And we would talk about playing sports. And, and so that happened several times. And I met Cliff Schaefer and Broussard and Carr and Townsend. And um, in July of that year, Harry Truman signed the integration uh, role, and uh, eight of those black policemen that I already knew moved into my barracks. The integration took about 15 minutes. Your wow. bunk's over there, you, you're you over there, you're <laughs> over there, and, and those guys I knew moved in, and I thought, well, that's a good deal. These are Plus, we began to win softball games. A couple of them were good softball players, and our losing uh, police team began winning. Uh, so it was, uh, but you know, I look back, I was so naive and so innocent. Uh, I had no problem with it. Not, I can't, I, I can honestly say I went, uh, it, you know, good move, it's about time. But I, I was, until I rode that bus across the South, I didn't realize the depth of segregation and the ugliness of it and the unfairness of it. Mm -hmm. And so now I look back and I thought, well, if Harry Truman signed that rule, that means that the whole country integrated all at once. <laughs> it didn't happen that way. <laughs> you know, I look back now, we were several years ahead of our country. Uh, my gosh, the Martin Luther King uh, days uh, all the way up into the 60s. So I, I, from my perspective, I just sort of watched it all unfold. But I, I think I can uh, honestly say I'm a equal opportunity guy. I accept people for what they bring to the table. Uh, everything else is inconsequential. Uh, you know, someone once asked Henry Ford, the car builder, who should be the leader? He said, that's like asking who should sing tenor in a quartet? He said, obviously, the man who can sing tenor. Who should be chief master sergeant of the Air Force? The best person that you can interview and find. 
who should be the cop on the street, the person most qualified to be. Uh, that's always been uh, that's always been my uh, my foundation. So I I think people should. You know, the worst thing about segregation was the denial of opportunity. Mm. I think it's one thing, Caleb. If you or I interview for something and we're not selected, we probably say, okay, the other person might have been a little a little bit more qualified. But if they say, uh, Bob, we're going to interview you, but Caleb, you're not even going to be interviewed. That's the inequity when, yeah. when you don't even give people a chance when you slam a door in their face. Yes, sir. And, and that's what, that to me is the worst part of it. People at least deserve an opportunity to sh showcase their talent and what they can do. That Look at the sports world. You know, in growing up in Indiana, this is a great story. Uh, in Lafayette, Indiana, they had uh, a semi-pro baseball team. And my brother John and I rarely missed a game. We'd ride the Greyhound bus 10 miles to watch the uh, Lafayette Merchants. And uh, every summer, they would play the Homestead Grays, the Kansas City Monarchs, and the Indianapolis Clowns. Those were all black teams. And the stands would be filled. If you didn't get a ticket early, you couldn't get in. And and Lafayette never won a game for many of them because I saw guys like Sam Jethro and, and Jackie Robinson play when they were 19, 20 years old playing in those, uh, in those uh, black leagues. And, you know, I thought, well, my gosh, they're a lot better than a lot of the major league players. <laughs> If I owned a major league team, I'd want them on my team. And that's what Branch Rickey finally did in 1947 when he brought uh, Robinson in. I, uh, so that was an injustice. And, you know, no matter how hard you try, it's hard to go back and undo an injustice. Mm -hmm. Now that's we're right. trying to go back and, and give those people the the uh, players that played Satchel Page and, and Gibson, Josh Gibson, we're trying now to give those guys recognition, but unfortunately they're six feet under. So they never did get the praise, except I can tell you, I saw some of them play and, and they were magic on a ball field. The Indianapolis Clowns were funny. The first baseman as part of their clown act would read a newspaper sitting on first base and during play, and a ball would be at the shortstop, and he'd just put the paper down and chest the ball. He was that good. And, and, and the crowd would go absolutely wild at the talent of those players. Well, hey, here's another. You get me started, and boy, I just go. In 1959, I was in MTI at Lackland, and women made up less than 1% of the active force. And there was a WAF basic training squadron where the girls were, tra were trained. And they were clear up on a corner of the base, far and removed from where the, the uh, male airmen were trained. And um, uh, the only time I saw the trainees was in the weekly parades. I'd watch the girls march by and I'd say, wow, they really march great. Wouldn't you know, in the fall of 1959, my commander, Major J. Hat, called me in, said, Sergeant Gaylor, you've been nominated to be interviewed to be the senior training NCO in the WAF Basic Training Squadron. What? What? I, yeah, in the WAF, uh, well, I went for interview, uh, Major Agnes McAmos and Norm Archer, and I was selected. So for two years, I was a WAF. If you can find a man that worked for a woman in the Air Force in 1960, I'll buy you dinner. I, and so for two years, I worked with female uh, airman trainees. And so in 1970, uh, when we uh, uh, started to bring in more women, I was ahead of the game. And all the big mouth guys were saying, I, I'm not working for no damn woman. 
you know, we're making a mistake. What are we doing bringing in all? And I, many times I said, hey, big mouth, uh, before you mouth off, you may want to shut up and give them a chance. I mean, I'm going to tell you something. They learn quickly and they're motivated and they want to serve. I said, I worked with them two years and I know more about it than most people. So uh, same thing in the, the integration of women into career fields. I was there, I was a part of it. So I don't know, I had a heads up uh, on, in both arenas. And, and uh, so when I say equal opportunity, I mean giving people a chance to show what they can do. And we look back now and I, I'd like to think that I uh, contributed uh, pretty good to, the, to those two scenes, the racial equality and the female equality yeah wow yeah, yes sir and um you know I, I was reading an article i saw how you were you know quite surprised by the you mentioned lack of opportunity for uh gender specific job opportunities or uh even uh african americans that weren't allowed to uh go into certain career fields uh how that was such a surprise for you and you called it a terrible social injustice um, I was wondering, what were your thoughts about uh, when Thomas Barnes uh, was able to hold the position of chief of the Air Force? And even now with uh, Chief Bass being the first female. Yeah, the um, uh, Tom Barnes reputation spread before he became the super chief. He was the uh, at Randolph as the air training command uh, chief. And they had an ugly racial situation down on the border at Laredo Air Base. And uh, the uh, general of ATC was going to send a team down there to do a, quote, thorough investigation. And Chief Barnes <laughs> said, uh, before we do that and, and blow this thing up, let me go down there and, and uh, see... Uh, you know, try to get a feel for just what happened. And uh, so Chief Barnes went down to Laredo and, and met with the groups. Uh, I, I talked with Tom about this later and he just talked with him and said, you know, what's going on here, guys? What, uh, what seems to be the problem? And believe it or not, he provided a, a pretty good remedy. His name, uh, uh, have you met Tom Barnes? Have you met Tom Barnes? So I heard about Tom before I, uh, meanwhile, I shipped to Germany in 71. And and when I shipped to Germany, Kissling was the chief master in the Air Force. So Tom was selected. Matter of fact, the command chief from USAFE interviewed Crawford Richardson was one who competed with Tom and Tom was selected. In 73, I came back to uh, uh, go to the senior academy because I had students there. I came back to be there with my graduating students. And um, wouldn't you believe that was May of, of uh, 74. And um, they, uh, someone said to me, Chief Barnes wants to meet you. I said, he does. I had never met the man. He does, said, yeah. Said, we're supposed to take you. He's staying in the embassy suites in Montgomery and we're supposed to take you there. He wants to talk to you. And so they drove me to the embassy suites and I went up to his room and he was getting dressed into his uh, uh, dress blue uniform. And uh, he was in his bedroom and he said, he came out and shook my hand and he said, if you don't mind, he said, I'm sort of rushed. I, I want to talk to you. And he kept coming in and out of the room. He was tying his <laughs> necktie and going back in the room. And a couple of times I was talking to the wall. It's a strange <laughs> way to meet somebody while they're getting, while they're getting dressed in the embassy suites. So I was there with Tom for about uh, 20 and, or 30 minutes. The reason he wanted to talk to me was because the Air Force had just announced 
that uh, Dave Jones had been picked to be chief of staff of the Air Force. And I worked for Dave Jones in Germany. And what Tom wanted to know was what kind of a general is he and what are his expectations and what is, that's why Tom wanted to pick my brain. So that was how I met Tom Barnes. He was getting dressed. And uh, we became very close and I eventually followed him into the job. Tom was, uh, uh, Tom was, you know, people said to me when I became number five, oh, you're going to replace Tom Barnes. I said, let me tell you something. Nobody can replace Tom Barnes. Tom was a unique talent. Tom was a special guy. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into Washington and be Bob Gaylor because I'm better at being Bob Gaylor than anybody else in the world. Uh, and I tell people that when they say, oh, you're going to replace uh, so-and-so. No, I'm going to move into the position and be Bob Gaylor. And I, that's what I told Joanne Bass. Yeah, don't try to uh, to replace K. Wright. Just be Joanne Bass. I've known Joanne for ten years. I knew her good fellow in Keesler. She's she's a bright star, and so my advice to her was just be Joanne Bass. Apparently, it works. It got you to where you are. <laughs> I would tell anyone that. Just be get your act together and be yourself, because nobody can be you better than you. So um, yeah, well. Um, I went to Tom's funeral. He's buried up in Bonham, Texas, in a family plot. And uh, I went to Tom's uh, funeral. That was so sad. And since then, his wife Marie has died. My son Kenny and Tom and Tom's son Tommy Jr. were good friends in college. So we have a. Um, they built. Uh, you get me started here, and I can't shut off. <laughs> in 1976 uh, at Andrews, they built a house uh, for the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, 1149 Dawson Court. They built it just for the big chief. But Tom uh, already lived on the base in a in a house back in the woods, an old brick house that before Andrews became a base was where the sheriff of the county lived. And Tom lived, he had to go down a dirt road through a, a lot of trees. He was back there, no one even knew the house was there. But that's where Tom lived because he liked to grow tomatoes and his boys uh, passed a football and they had a lot of room out there. So Tom did not want to move into the house built for the chief master sergeant of the Air Force. So General Earl Brown, who was the commander at Andrews, he selected another chief, Bill Semper and his wife Jackie, to move into the chief master sergeant of the Air Force house uh, with the provision that whoever replaced Barnes, uh, that he might have to vacate quickly when the new guy took over. Well, that new guy was me. So my wife Selma and I were the first to live at 1149 Dawson Court uh, because Tom was in the job for a year but didn't want to move. So the Sempers lived there for a year. And so that worked out great. I bought the drapes and the carpeting from Bill Semper when Selma and I moved in. Since then, they've built a new house, uh, one airy court, where Jim Roy was the first to live in. And since then, Cody and uh, uh, Kay Wright and now Joanne Bass lives there at one area court. So 1149 Dawson Court was where five through 15 lived. 10 of us lived there. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Tom Barnes was a dear friend. I loved the guy. So he, I got it. Uh, you know, he would, Tom was funny. He'd start to tell a joke and he'd start laughing because he knew the punchline. And it would, take him, <laughs> it would take him forever to tell the joke. And he'd be laughing. We'd say, would you please finish this? <laughs> because he'd be laughing because he knew the punchline. He, I, I used to love him tell a joke. A two minute joke would take at least 16 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a lot like me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Tom was a was a great chief. He um, 
General Jones kept him in the job almost four years uh, because General Jones explained to me, he said, he's got some irons in the fire that I want to give him opportunity to complete. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that's why Tom was in the job uh, that long because uh, he was working some issues that Jones felt he needed to have a chance to finish up with. So I went in there in July of 77. One thing I wanted to ask you, sir, is uh, when you were uh, in the military serving the position as chief master of the Air Force, and even before that, you had family, two boys, two girls married. How was it for you balancing personal and professional life? You know, looking back, and of course, my daughter sitting here, Carol was our firstborn. Uh, they, I had two remote assignments. I went to Kunsan, Korea when I had a two-year-old, one-year-old and six-week-old. I had a six-week-old baby, Elaine, born July 31st and early September, I uh, reported to Kunsan, Korea. I had a second one, Korat, Thailand. I had uh, three teenagers and a nine-year-old. And we were at uh, Barksdale, Louisiana. And so obviously I had a great wife. Uh, Selma and I were married about 59 years. She passed away in 2012. And one of my sons died. Eddie died in 2000 of renal failure. Uh, he was 45 years old. And um, so I had a great family. Uh, but you know, uh, before Selma and I married, we talked about, uh, I said, you know, I'm in the Air Force. I'm subject to get moved at any time, even remotely. So we communicated that. So it was no surprise. Uh, we knew that it could happen and it happened twice. She was a strong lady and she did, she did a great job. No question about it. But you know, I, I was so dedicated to the Air Force that now I look back in retrospect and I said, there were probably times when I didn't balance that very well. Mm. I just never said no to the Air Force. Yeah, one time I retired from USA Insurance in 95 and I began visiting Air Force Base. I did 43 bases in 2003 and wow. one time uh, Selma walked me out to say goodbye in the driveway and uh, uh, we hugged and she said to me, you know something, we are getting very good at saying goodbye. Hmm. And I remember driving to the airport going, wow, that's a powerful statement. Yeah. And I said to myself, Bob, <laughs> you know, you better take a step back and take a look at this. Cause I was saying yes to everything. Yeah. And we were getting very good at saying goodbye. So that was a, that was a great word that either take her with me or learn how to say no. So uh, it's so important. The family is so vital uh, that, yeah, there were times when I probably violated the advice I now give, but I, I think as much as possible. Uh, you know, one thing we did at, uh, at uh, when I was in SAC at Columbus, Mississippi, we had family day mm -hmm. where everybody was encouraged, bring your family to your workstation. And uh, so my kids went to my security police office and maintenance people took their kids out on the flight line. And even in the alert facility, they let the crew members take their family. That was a great move. Yeah, otherwise, you know, dad comes home and says, I don't want to talk about it today. It was not a good day and the kids uh, think that the military service is their enemy because dad's in a bad mood. So that was a great move. Uh, communication is so vital and include mm -hmm. the family and uh, uh, remove the mysteries of the military way of life through communication. My kids became military. My uh, Carol's son, Josh, is a lieutenant colonel at Barksdale now. 
Nice. And uh, Elaine is married to a retired master sergeant medic, Dave Swidell. And my son, Kenny, was a retired lieutenant colonel at Hurlburt. He was a 141 pilot out of Charleston. So um, uh, my family is uh, very Air Force oriented. We're Air Force blue. That's, that's really good advice. I was actually teaching a lesson today on how to be present and productive uh, in time management. And one of the, the lines I like from that is, does, does your job get the main entree and family get the leftovers? And it's really yeah. important to, to make sure you're balancing that out. Uh, Back per- in the uh, early TV days, the Ed Sullivan show, he, uh, on Sunday night, he'd bring one act after another. Uh, he was the guy that introduced the Beatles to America and yep. Elvis Presley moving his hips and uh, <laughs> Richard Pryor. But anyway, he always had the guy that would spin the plates. Yeah. And this guy would come out with a long pole and a plate and he'd spin the plate on the pole and we'd all go, wow, that's amazing. But he didn't stop there. He'd do seven or eight plates and he'd have the plates spinning. And when it appeared that a plate was about to wobble, he'd spin the plate. And uh, at the end of his act, he'd have about eight plates spinning and the audience would go wild, yay. And I thought, that's just like life. Mm. You and I, every day when we get up, we spin the plates. We have to determine what plate needs spinning, spinning Mm. the right plates. And some plates may cost 40 cents at Walmart, and some are Nortaki, $40 a plate. And so I meet a lot of people over the years that are spinning the 40 cent plates at, while the $40 plates are crashing on the floor all around them because they don't know how to set priorities. Mm-hmm. They spin the wrong plates. Mm. And so that's, you can use that in your talk about uh, spinning the right plates, setting priorities. You've got to look at your agenda for the day and say, what needs my attention right now? And uh, some plates may have to uh, crash to the floor and break, but hopefully they're your 40 cent plates and not your $40 plate. <laughs> so it, it's a good analogy for teaching yeah. time management and addressing priorities is, is spending spinning the right place. One thing about time is that whether you're uh, the king of the world or a a beggar on the street, we all get 168 hours a week. Time is the fairest thing uh, uh, in our life. Everybody gets 168 hours a week. And some people use it effectively and some people waste it. It's a matter of uh, setting priorities. So back to your question, there were times when I was probably spinning the wrong plate, but I didn't know it until I matured and grew up. And I look back, I say, yeah, I, I could have handled a couple of those things better. Yeah. I appreciate that. To that, sir, um, you've talked about a lot of the influences and influencers in your life, um, your wife, Chief Barnes, uh, the experiences you've had dealing with integration, spinning the right plates, maybe deciding which ones to drop and which ones to keep going. Who were or who are some of your mentors in your early career and even later on in your career as a leader, the leader, enlisted leader of the Air Force um, that helped you know which plates to, to spin, helped you pick those pieces up? And what form did that mentorship take? The, uh, about 1955, I was a, a tech sergeant. <clears throat> My boss was a master sergeant, McCulley. Uh, he assigned a person to work for me that I didn't want working for me. Uh, McCulley uh, said words to the effect, you don't always get to pick who works for you. I, I try to even it out, make it fair to everyone. And at that time, I uh, uh, expressed my displeasure by uh, using profanity and raising my voice and uh, storming out of his office. 
and I got about uh, 10 steps down the walk and the uh, flight sergeant on duty uh, said, Sergeant Gaylor. I said, yes. He said, Sergeant McCulley wants you back in his office. And I walked in and made the mistake of saying, now what do you want? And what followed was what is known in the uh, Gaylor history book as the best butt chew and I ever got in my life. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I had it coming. I, I, I'll never forget his words. He said, uh, you cannot talk to me like that. He said, oh, that sounded pretty good. Let me repeat it. You cannot talk to me like that. He said, there are a lot of things you could have said, but you cannot talk to me like you just did. He said, now I've always enjoyed having you work for me, but you're going to have to decide uh, whether you want that relationship to continue. <clears throat> but he said, let me repeat, you cannot <laughs> talk. <laughs> when he finished, uh, he convinced me I couldn't talk to him like that. <laughs> and uh, I, I was angry with him when I walked out. Who does he think he is? But by the time I got home, I said, you know, I had that coming. And he had the courage. That's the important point. He had the courage to do it. Yeah. Had I gotten in my car and driven home, I'd have thought, hey, I'm king of the hill. I can sass anybody I want. Hey, I got away with that. He, so my God, I, uh, the story goes on, but it's too long to tell, but maybe someday I'll be able to finish the story. But uh, wow, uh, that was a maturing process in one 10 minute session that he taught me the importance of respect and not getting too big for my britches. I made tech certain in five years and seven months. I guess I thought I was God's gift to the Air Force. And uh, he taught me that I was uh, Bob Gaylor, air policeman who had taken an oath to serve faithfully. And so in um, 1970, three-star General Dave Jones at Barksdale picked me to be the command sergeant major. And uh, he got his four star and went to Germany and invited me to go with him. And then he became chief of staff and he selected me to be number five. So I worked for Dave Jones for nine years. So uh, he was my mentor, sponsor. He was brilliant. He was the most visionary man. He was always a year ahead of everyone else in thinking. And he was a great uh, uh, equality guy. And he believed in education. Um, he, we opened the NCO Academy at Gunner in 73. And uh, we opened 70 leadership schools in 1977. That was all Dave Jones. He believed that you cannot order people to do something. You have to educate them to do it and do it right. So he was, uh, uh, he is now deceased as is Sergeant McCulley. Uh, they are in my memory bank, and I'm forever grateful. So, uh, Willard McCulley, Dave Jones, my wife Selma, and many others, my gosh, many others. But those come to mind uh, because, you know, I go, thanks, I needed that. <laughs> thanks, I needed that. They said and did things right at the right time. Timing is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if you give somebody advice and uh, they can't relate it to anything, it's probably uh, deaf ears. But if it happens when it's needed, man, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. No, I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. One thing that really stands out to me and, and always has when it comes to you is, is how prideful you are still to this day to have served for our country. And Oftentimes people come in and they're, they're prideful at some point in time. And usually they get that uniform for the first time at Lackland. They see their name across their chest. They see Air Force across their chest. But then sometimes we get, we get lost in what's on our sleeves or what's on our, the middle of our chest with the rank. What is it for you that has kept you prideful this long? I, uh, 
I have a great sense of humor and sense of the ridiculous. I, I have never taken myself too seriously. I give advice, take your job seriously, take yourself lightly. Some people take mm. themselves too seriously and, and uh, uh, it just uh, causes stress. Uh, Ken Blanchard, the guy I mentioned uh, earlier, Ken Blanchard's the guy that wrote all the one minute manager books. He wrote a whole series of, he became quite noted. He told an audience, I got to know Ken quite well. We did some stage work together. He told an audience, Bob Gaylor is weird. He said he confuses work and play. He thinks work is supposed to be fun. He's never learned that work is supposed to be a drudge. And he was doing this cynically to make the point that work is as natural as play if the conditions are favorable. And I always found the conditions favorable. I've never, I've never found work to be work as others may think of it. I think work is as exciting as play. I think working the main gate at Waco Air Base is as ex is exciting as playing around the golf or dribbling a basketball. I enjoyed work and I still do. I still uh, work around my house and in the yard uh, with the energy level I now have. But I, I don't know, I just, uh, I was always motivated. I don't recall ever ever going uh, going to work and saying, oh, this is a drudge. I, uh, call me crazy. Maybe I am weird, but I confuse work and play. I think the supervisor's job is to make the conditions favorable. And, and there, therein lies the answer, what makes effective leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, George Patton, the famous World War II, his nickname was Blood and Guts. He was a, a, an authoritarian, but uh, here's what he said to the soldiers. He said, we are engaged in war. And he said, people are going to be killed. But he said, if we stick together and take care of one another and look out for one another and follow the game plan, your chances of going back to Peoria, Illinois are greater. You go out on your own and become a loner, <laughs> you know, there's not much I can do for you. So he cared about people, but in a different way. But all great leaders care about people. And I always cared about my people. I, I included them. Here's why we are working. This is what we do here. And you are important because you contribute to that. And without you, we wouldn't be able to get the job done. So I made the conditions favorable. Mm. And if I was able to upgrade the surround, I did. Hey, we got a new uh, typewriter. Hey, we got a new chair. Hey, we got a new policy. You know, uh, uh, they. so you make the conditions favorable, both uh, in the environment and both in the... Uh, decision process. Thank you, Chief. And I want to I want to take it back just a little bit um, and talk a little bit about your development before um, you became chief, which uh, impressingly you did. You rose through the ranks quite quickly while you were at Karat. Am I, am I pronouncing that correctly? Karat? Karat. Karat. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Karat. But before that, you, you, in 1964, you were at Columbus Air Force Base, uh, where you attended NCO Academy uh, at Barksdale, and then was offered to teach, to accept a faculty position. Can you talk to me or to us uh, and the listeners about um, that experience going from student to instructor? And, and I quote, you said it was like, a rocket lit under you, uh, and you don't understand why people don't want to go. Can you share that experience? The uh, in the fifties and early sixties, academies were owned by commands, 
TAC Academy, MAC Academy, SAC Academy. And if you were in a command that did not have an academy, you never got to go. And I was in Air Training Command. They didn't have an academy till 1973. And I was in PACAF, uh, uh, Korea and Japan. So I was a senior master sergeant and had never been to a NCO academy. So I get to Columbus, Mississippi, my first venture into SAC. And in the uh, fall of, of 64, personnel called and said, Gaylor, you're going to Barksdale Academy. I said, you got to be kidding. I said, I'm a senior master sergeant. Why don't you send uh, some uh, deserving tech sergeant? He said, well, you've never been. I said, well, that part's true. He said, well, you're going. I said, okay. So uh, uh, in the spring of 65, I drove my 56 Chevy uh, to uh, Bossier City, Louisiana, about 300 miles. And I remember driving, I said, what in heaven's name am I doing? Why am I going to an NCO academy? So I get there and I check in, I'm assigned to C flight. They, they had a roster already made out. My roommate is Wayne DG from Clinton Sherman Air Base, Oklahoma. And, I, and I'm, uh, you know, going, okay, let, six weeks, let's get it on. Uh, well, I, I, um, we start class and believe it or not, my uh, instructor for 60 hours was Jim McCoy, who followed me as number six. He was my instructor. And I sat right in front of his podium because he sat us alphabetically. We were 20 per flight. I was in C flight. And uh, he began talking things I'd never heard of. And my mind just started saying, wow, hey, I never heard of that. Gosh, that's new. I think I can use that. Holy mackerel, you know. The, and I start going to World Affairs. Uh, Gene Chamberlain was the instructor. And Ed Ellis taught effective speaking, how to prepare a, a briefing effectively. Oh, wow, I, lights were blinking rapidly in my head. I really got into it. And because I had been an MTI at Lackland, I had uh, drill and ceremonies nailed. My gosh, I could uh, by the right flank march. So uh, I helped a lot of my fellow students and we'd gather in the day room at eight o'clock every night and I'd review the classes of the day because they came pretty easy for me. And I was a good note taker. And so I would sort of be like a adjunct instructor at, in the day room at eight o'clock at night. I'd draw a pretty good crowd. And um, on, uh, at the banquet, and now we will present the Honor Graduate Award. And I'm sitting there, and, and the winner of the Honor Graduate Award uh, from Columbus, Mississippi, and they called my name. My God, that had never happened to me. I, whoa, I walked on air up there to get my trophy. And I drove back in my 56 Chevy to Columbus and, and the lights were still blinking. I, uh, that, you know, I, I think looking back, as a cop, I had sort of leveled off. I had sort of plateaued. I, I think my mind was at the point where I thought, been there, done that. I've investigated everything you can investigate. I've put people in jail. I've, that, that was a relaunching. That's the best way to say it. Somebody lit my afterburner. That academy... It was, boy, you talk about thanks. I needed that. I had 15 and a half years service. And boy, that was uh, that was uh, uh, a rocket. Well, then out of the clear blue sky, wouldn't you know, you talk about uh, uh, weird things happening. A faculty member at Marksdale was arrested off base for DWI. And they fired him. And that created the opening. Had he not been arrested, there would not have been an opening. You talk about fate. 
And, and um, so they had an opening and they called me and said, you're our first choice. <laughs> and, uh, wow, out of a clear blue. And I was so, I was so caught up in that academy process as a student that I, I just couldn't say no. And um, uh, believe it or not, when I was hired, <clears throat> they closed the academy dormitory to air condition it. So they canceled four classes. So when I got there in July, there was no class until January. And so they sent me to Maxwell, Alabama to academic instructor school, six weeks. And so I drove uh, once again across the deep south to Montgomery, Alabama in 1965, right, the same year that uh, Dr. King had marched. I had never been to Montgomery. I remember driving by the Capitol. Uh, it was all lit up at night. And I went to academic instructor because I had uh, Major Niazek was my instructor. And I was selected as one of uh, the distinguished graduates. And um, I got back to Barksdale. I couldn't wait to have students. I wanted to run out and hug the first class when they arrived in January. And um, I taught two classes and we went to student retreat and we were at student retreat. Uh, the students were in formation and a runner came and said faculty meeting back in the building right after retreat. And we assembled and a guy said, you know, it's time to announce promotion to chief. I'll bet they're gonna, I'll bet they're gonna announce promotion to chief. I'll bet you made it. No, I'll bet you made it. So there was a lot of uh, joking and we're sitting there, you know, all acting funny. And the commandant, Major Robinson came in. He said, I got a message from SAC. I'll read it to you. And then you'll know as much as I know. Effective upon the graduation of class 66B, all NCO academies are, are closed until further notice. Instructors will return to their career fields and, and uh, uh, for uh, assignment. <laughs> and we all just sat there. And, and we just sat there, long face, we just sat there. And finally, Gaylor, who's always trying to be funny, I said, what about promotion to chief? <laughs> you know, just trying to break the tension because we were all sitting there. Upon graduation, all academies are closed. And so at Barksdale, I went down to the cop squadron and I said, here I am, Senior Mass Sergeant Gaylor. And the, uh, the major said, what do you want? I said, a job. He said, who are you? And what do you, what do you, that, that's exactly how it happened. So I was a cop there until I got orders for Karat Thailand later that year. <laughs> you talk about looking back over your life and saying fate, opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, when I left Karat, I had orders for Grand Forks, North Dakota. And I went back to get my family in Shreveport to go to North Dakota. And my wife knew about the reopening in the SAC Academy. I didn't know it. It took me three days to fly home from Bangkok. And uh, uh, Jim McCoy had since moved up to SAC headquarters. And when they decided to open the Academy, he said to Colonel Williams, the DP, the first guy we got to get is Bob Gaylor. And, and uh, Colonel Williams said, well, where is he? He said, he's on his way to Grand Forks. And he said, well, they need him at Grand Forks as a cop. And McCoy said, uh, we, uh, really, he's, he's that great or something. Jim likes to tell the story. But Jim McCoy rescued me and diverted me to Barksdale. I never, I never went to Grand Forks. That happened while I was on the way home. So you talk about timing. So in January of uh, 68, I was assigned the academy. We didn't have students till July. 
So once again, I was ready to, uh, to go out and hug the students. We hired 22 faculty members by looking at uh, personnel packages. Floor length photo. Yeah, I remember saying, we can't hire that guy. Look at his sideburns. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. We, we sat there as a board and selected the faculty looking at a personnel package. Where'd this guy go to the NCO Academy? Well, he went to TAC Academy at Tyndall. Well, okay, he looks like a good one. Let's hire him. And uh, so we ended up with 20, uh, two faculty members, no blacks. We did not have a black. I have a faculty picture and you can see there are no women and no blacks. We didn't even take female students until four classes. We took four females in class 69D. 69D, we took four women, four tech sergeants. And uh, uh, we didn't hire, we hired Dale Armwood, a black female. So we, we did what? Two birds with one stone. We hired a black and a female and one person, Dale Armwood. She now lives here in San Antonio. She's a retired chief. In 1973, she was the first black and first female on the SAC Academy faculty at Barksdale, Louisiana. Meanwhile, wow. I had moved to Germany with General Jones. <laughs> so boy, what a great, uh, you look back and uh, you almost say, I can't believe all that happened. Yeah, one, one thing that stands out to me is constantly adapting to new situations and not just adapting, but thriving in those. And even in the military now, uh, a lot of doors are open, whether it's developmental special duties, um, you know, going off and becoming like a security manager. Uh, but what advice would you give to people out there who are unsure about branching outside of the primary career fields? I, I would say the first thing you need to know is that there's a risk involved. I mean, if you had said to me, you're our first choice to be on the academy faculty and we're going to close after two classes and, and you'll be out of a job, the odds are I would have said no. When I took the job, uh, I thought, my God, I'll be there at least three, four years. You know, I don't, so there's a risk involved. The bottom can fall out. Listen, I flew on a charter, uh, military charter jet 265 of us on an airplane from Oakland, California to Clarkfield, Philippines. 18 hour flight, I put a blanket over my head. And I asked myself, what in the hell am I doing here? <laughs> what, I said, what just happened? I was minding my business in Columbus, Mississippi I go to the academy, they offer me a faculty job, and now I'm on my way to a place I can't even pronounce. And, and you go, you know, so I would say to anyone, there might be a risk involved, but uh, no guts, no glory. Yeah. yeah. If you don't go out on a limb, uh, you'll retire 20 years and say, I never had an opportunity. And I say, yeah, you did. You just didn't know it when it came. Yeah. I had a uh, master sergeant at uh, McDill, Florida. So I've been offered a chance to be a first sergeant, but they told me I'd have to go to another base. And he said, my wife's got a good job. We just bought a house. My kids are in school. So he talked himself out of what one of his goals in life was because he wasn't able to, you got to give to get the sacrifice. So I would say to anyone, uh, you got to, yeah, occasionally you got to say, I, I think this is it. You know, I was in Croat, Thailand, and I used to go to the crew briefings. And Colonel Chersel was the wing commander. And I'd be sitting in the back, and, and the pilots would be in the room. And Colonel Chersel would say, all right, uh, now we need the weather wag. Okay, now we need the target wag. Okay, now we need the uh, uh, this wag. I don't know what wag was. I started saying, well, the weather wag. Well, it's wild ass gas. Yeah, wag is wild ass gas. 
uh, sometimes you've got to go with a wild ass guess because if, if you say the weather guy would say, well, it looks like the weather, <laughs> you know, and the target, it looks like based on what we know, sometimes you've got to do a wag. Sometimes you've got to go, it, it looks like, I think, <laughs> you know, and so you might say, I think this is it, and it may not be. They may say the sun will be shining, you may run into a thunderstorm. But uh, yeah, that's great. Sometimes you've got to wag it. Yeah, so, and if you don't have that kind of courage, well, lead a boring career. You got to go out there. You, you got to say, I think, I think this is it. I think this is it. You, you, sir, definitely did not live a boring career. You retired 31 July 1979 after being in 31 years. You were uh, the chief master sergeant of the Air Force. But before that, did there ever come a time in your career where you had considered going the officer route? Um, uh, 1954, when I had six years service, I almost got out. I decided I was going to be a Texas highway patrolman because I had met Bill Weeks and K.D. Harrell at my air base, and I had become good friends. They were troopers. And they said, Gaylor, uh, you'd make a great Texas Highway Patrolman. I took the physical and passed it. I took the written test and passed it. And the only thing I lacked was a board interview in Harlingen, Texas. And it was all scheduled. And three days before uh, the interview, I said to my wife, we'd been married for a year. I said, how do you feel about me getting out? And she said, well, you know, I sort of enjoy the commissary and the BX and the medical care. She said, I wouldn't mind if you stayed in. I never went for the interview. I have often wondered. I, I either would have been the uh, top guy in the, in the Texas State Police or I'd have been killed on the roadside north of Catula, Texas. I don't know. I've often wondered. <laughs> What would have happened? Okay, so I re-enlisted in 1954 for four years. And Major Kennard was the inspector general at my base. And one day he said to me, he said, Gator, how long have you been in the Air Force? I said, just over six years. And he said, you're a tech sergeant. And he said, master is as high as you can go. There was no senior rank then. And he said, you need to, to become an officer. He said, you're too bright. He said, if you make master in a couple of years, you're gonna be a master for the next 20 years. You need to go to officer candidate school that uh, now is OTS, then it was OCS. It was 90 days, they called, called you a 90 day wonder, 90 day wonder. I, I uh, came to Lackland. I flew, I drove up to Lackland from Laredo, 150 miles, and I took the OCS test and I passed. I remember the score, I made 69. They told me, your score is 69. And they said, you have four shots at it. We pick students quarterly and you'll have four choices, four quarters. And after that, Oh, and you're frozen to the base. You cannot be transferred during that year. If you're not picked in four classes, you're then uh, back for, uh, uh, you belong to the Air Force. You can, uh, your freeze is over. I didn't get picked. Quarter one went by, quarter two went by. To this day, they never told me why. <laughs> what, I have no idea why. And as soon as I came off freeze, I got orders for Korea. Meanwhile, I made master one April 56, seven years, seven months service. I was 25 years old, master sergeant. I was at the end of the grade. It was high as I could go. And I thought, well, buy a lot of chevrons. You're going to be wearing them for the next <laughs> one year. And... Uh, uh, so I got ordered for Kunsan, Korea, Master Sergeant Gaylor, turned 26, went, went to Kunsan, Master Sergeant Gaylor. 
And I got there, I was a provost sergeant. Provost sergeant, that was my title. Provost sergeant. No NCO Academy, no leadership school. You talk about flying by the seat of your pants. That's what I did. Uh, but I just relied on common sense and fair play. Make coming to work fun. Yeah, Bob Gaylor, confusing work and play. <laughs> what, uh, what's, what's the one thing you really learned about yourself kind of just being thrown and thrust into a leadership position? I learned a couple of things. One, uh, that I didn't always have to be right. Sometimes the other guy was more right than me. Some people think they're always right. Even these talking heads on television, <clears throat> they try to convince you they know what the hell they're talking about. This Dr. Fauci, instead of saying, I have no idea what to do about this virus, he changed his mind four or five times giving us wrong information. So uh, I found that uh, if I didn't know, I'd say, I, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Yes. Guess what? I don't know what to do. Mm. Uh, but together, you and I will find out. And, and second, I learned that I didn't know everything. I thought I was cop of the century. I was a very proud cop. But Willard McCulley brought me back down to earth. He said, you cannot talk to me like that. <laughs> you cannot talk to me like that, he said. And so I, uh, I, I found out where, where my notch was. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I have a tendency to oversimplify things, but it's not that difficult. Uh, if you look at life as something fascinating and interesting with uh, occasional roadblocks, uh, yeah, I've, I've been set back. When I retired from the Air Force, I was interviewed for a job in Washington. And 30 minutes into the interview, the guy said, uh, Chief, I want to be very honest with you. Uh, you aren't cut out for the job you're interviewing for. And I said, I knew that about 10 minutes before you did. I said, but I enjoyed the Danish pastry and the cup of coffee. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I laughed all the way back to Pentagon. Uh, they wanted me to manage a 14-story office building <laughs> uh, to manage the uh, businesses coming in. I had been nominated by, by a guy. So I went to the interview just for the experience. But yeah, I, I found out that uh, there's a place in the sun for everyone. Uh, and uh, I call it getting pinged. Uh, when I was born, the good Lord pinged me to be a speaker. Uh, I, I'm not lying when I tell you I don't know how to raise the hood of a car. And even if I did accidentally raise it, I wouldn't know what to do after I got the hood up. I have no mechanical talent. When I pick up a hammer, my family scurries <laughs> they, uh, because I become dangerous. Mm. I talk. I've made an excellent living uh, talking and motivating and team building and, and uh, confusing work and play <laughs> <laughs> all of that sounds like a great recipe for you becoming chief of the air force which you you did what, what a great accomplishment tell us about that the 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 notification of your candidacy into the position you stepping up into the position and maybe some of the challenges and triumphs you faced as a chief of of the air force 1974, Dave Jones became chief of staff. I said goodbye to him on the ramp in Ramstein, Germany. He and his wife and son and cat got on an <laughs> airplane with their furniture. I shook his head, said goodbye. <laughs> and uh, he said to me, where do we go from here? I said, I know where you're going. I said, I have no idea where I'm going. And here came a general, John Vogt, V-O-G-T. And I was at the airplane when he arrived. And I shook his hand in, in uh, May of 1974. 
And I worked for him till August and I never saw him again. He could care less if I was his senior enlisted advisor. He at staff meeting, he said, my only concern is flying airplanes. If the rest of you want to come staff meeting, that's okay. And it's okay if you don't. Uh, so he was a totally different general. So for three months, I just kept doing uh, what I was uh, doing. And, and in August of 74, I get a call from the Pentagon, General Tallman, Major General Tallman from personnel. He said, well, General Jones is, has decided what he wants you to do. And I said, what's that? He said, he wants you to travel the Air Force talking leadership. I said, what? He said, he, he just wants you to uh, travel the Air Force doing what you did in Europe. Talk about team building and motivation and leadership. And he said to tell you he doesn't care where you do it out of, either Maxwell, Pentagon, Randolph, you pick. He said, uh, call me back and let me know. I said, I don't have to call you back. I'll tell you right now, Randolph. So in August 74, I was assigned to Randolph with blanket orders that allowed me to travel anywhere in the Air Force world. And uh, 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 nobody, who is this guy? Who is Bob Gaylor? Uh, well, I understand he worked for Dave Jones. And, uh, and so they assigned me to the personnel center at Randolph. And um, uh, I put together a two-hour talk, and I, I began inviting myself to bases. Within six months, I was getting calls. Can you come to my base? So I built my own reputation. I put together a two-hour talk on styles of leadership. No break. Two hours. I gave six, uh, six talks at each base. I stayed three days. Uh, two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon for three days. Uh, I gave my talk. I had slides that you laid on a, a, a machine. And uh, I had humor in it, and I had leadership in it, and I had audience involvement in it. And uh, I would go to a base, and the first audience would be maybe 16 or 18 people. And the second audience that afternoon, maybe 48 or 50. And the next morning, 122. And by my, by my sixth and final talk, I'd have uh, standing around uh, the walls of the base theater. Wow. Uh, I earned my own reputation by my enthusiasm, motivation, humor, and my message. You got to hear this guy. I had uh, airmen years later come to me and say, uh, my sergeant made me come to your talk. And I went there planning to get a couple hours sleep. And you started talking. And he said, within minutes, I was looking for a notepad to take notes. And he said, I owe these stripes I'm wearing to you. I've had guys say that to me. I owe wow. these to you. And so for three years, that's what I did. Well, I developed my own reputation, uh, working in harmony with, uh, uh, with Tom Barnes. And so people began to say, uh, I bet you you're going to uh, uh, take Tom Barnes's place. And my answer was always, they know where to find me. <laughs> if they're looking for me, they know how to get a hold of me. Never once did I ever say, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to be number five. I never, never, because I wasn't prepared not to be selected. So I never thought that I would be. And uh, 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 matter of fact, uh, I met a board with four other chiefs. Uh, and I was angry at General Jones for making me meet a board. I said, my God, I've been with him seven years. I've done everything he wanted me to do. Why is he making me meet a board? I didn't know until later that he told General Tallman uh, announced Gaylor as the next chief. And Tolman told him, sir, you can't do that. That would start a, a precedent we don't want to start. And Jones said, well, what do we have to do? He said, well, we have to have a board. He said, okay, have a board and then announce Gaylor as the next <laughs> chief. I didn't know that till Tolman tell me that. 
he told me that a year later when he was superintendent at the Air Force Academy. He said, you don't uh, even know what really happened, do you? I said, well, no, I have no way of knowing. And he told me that. So uh, Jones uh, uh, rewarded me or whatever you say. So I get into the Pentagon in July of uh, 79. I'm already, or 77. Everybody already knew me. God, my name was all over the Air Force. I had been, I went 34 days to PACAF with my road show. Uh, I went 17 days to Alaska. Hmm. I was as well known as Tom Barnes almost. Everybody knew Gaylor and his dog and pony show. Have you ever heard Bob <laughs> Gaylor? No, you got to hear him. So I, and you know what? I didn't own a mess dress. I was speaking at banquets wearing my uh, black bow tie and my <laughs> blue uniform. I didn't have a mess dress, so I became chief master in the Air Force. And I got a $565 clothing allowance to buy two mess dresses. In those days, we had a summer white jacket and a winter black jacket. So mm. we had two, two different seasonal mess dresses. So I get into the Pentagon and it didn't take, take me long to find out that the big issues were image, utilization of women, racial equality and drug and alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. We had airmen smoking pot on the flight line in 1977. You could open a dormitory door and the, the whiff coming out would floor you, knock you back down the steps. Hash and marijuana had become, uh, uh, and growing hair. Afros were out to here. Uh, and, uh, and everybody wanted to have hair. They'd slick their hair down with, uh, with grease so they could blow dry it at night. Uh, uh, well, I don't recall ever going to work as chief master on the airport and saying, I don't have anything to do today. <laughs> My plate was full. My cup runneth over. There was uh, plenty to do. And uh, uh, the only thing I can say is we did it with Dave Jones. He moved up to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1978 and Lou Allen became chief of staff. So I worked for two different four stars as chief master in the Air Force, totally different. Jones, uh, the brilliant visionary the low key, somewhat shy introvert, Alan uh, with the big smile that you uh, want to be your grandfather, uh, too different, but uh, totally effective, mm. which makes a good point that uh, every leader should use their own style uh, to uh, reach the objectives, but not try to be somebody they're not. Yeah. That's that's good advice. From Mulberry, Indiana. I I see a lot of, especially the course that we instruct, where a lot of commandants go to a new school and uh, they struggle because the cadre is used to the previous commandant. And some of the advice we give them is just be your own person, be you. Um, you kind of talked about, well, you did just talk about the uh, how you would go around and you had your uh, lessons that you would teach on the projectors, and you got a reputation that started to kind of follow you around. It's kind of like now with social media, how now we have, you know, whether it's Chief Rider, Chief Bass, or these individuals who they're known prior to uh, taking over the position. So what is your opinions now on how social media has kind of played such a uh, dominant role in the military and society? The, the thing about social media, it seems to me relatively easy to put on an act or to try to be somebody you're not, where, you know, in your attempt to impress, I'm on the screen. Uh, and, and you, I notice that on, uh, on the cable networks that people try to be holier than thou and better than you and pompous and arrogant. And, and I think if they're that way in real life, they, they're probably not very much fun to be with. I, I'm Bob Gaylor. What you see is what you get. With all the warts and the, uh, 
<laughs> you know, and, uh, I just think honesty. Um, that was all. I tried to be honest. I tried to be honest, and, and sometimes people didn't like it. Um, so I, I just think that uh, and social media, when I do Wednesday with the chief, um, this is the way I act. Uh, with my, you can see my red up here. I had cancer surgery. It's healing. But who else would go on TV and sit here with a, a big red mark on there? Yeah, Bob Gaylor would do that because uh, yeah, it would be hard to conceal and be somebody you're not. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I think a person should be who they are. But, and here's the big uh, but, <laughs> the big but. <laughs> Allow other people to be who they are. Mm. Yeah, allow other people to be who they are. I accept people for, that doesn't mean I like it, Ray. I met people I didn't like almost immediately. And by being with them, they proved why I didn't. Uh, yeah, so I'm not saying that, uh, I, uh, I'm i sort of selective, but there's enough great people out there that I have thousands of good friends. <laughs> because I let them be who they are and, and they let me be who I am. Oh, that's Bob Gaylor, yeah. Yeah, I had, when I became Chief Master of the Air Force, people said to me, well, you haven't changed. I said, why would I change? What I was was what got me here. I'm, I'm yeah, why do you want me to put on an act? I'm Bob Gaylor. Thank you, Chief. I have one quick question, really quick. So, um, you know, we like to, uh, AKA, a lot of our, our chiefs and our, especially our great chiefs and everything, um, you know, they called Chief Wright uh, enlisted Jesus. Chief Bass has yet to, un to get her AKA. Did you have one? I, I don't remember. I might have, but it might have been not one that was publicly shared. <laughs> no, I think for the most part, they said, uh, you know, I think my reputation of, you got to get Bob Geller to your base. He's, he's talkative, he's honest, he's funny, uh, he, he's lively, he's positive, he promotes the Air Force. You know, I, uh, I've spoken to uh, literally millions of people. I never ever put an audience down. I always leave them in a, I always leave them in a high note. When I speak to ALSs now, I tell them, I have the greatest respect for you. I tell them you'd be my number one draft pick. I'd want you on my team. I, I never put, put an audience down or a person down. Um, I, I just uh, think, um, I don't know, that's how I was raised. Before you say anything bad about a person, you have to say something good about them. <laughs> and then you can say something bad about them. So, uh, you know, I, uh, it's a simple philosophy, but it's worked for me. Yeah, uh, I... Uh, I think if you ask anybody, do uh, you know Bob Gale? So, oh, yeah. Yeah, I know Bob. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, people say things to me that are almost scary. I, why I have people say to me that uh, you changed my life. You made me realize. They say stuff that I go, whoa. But, boy, that's powerful. That's money in the bank. I mean... As an educator, what are you and I trying to do? You're trying to influence people. Mm -hmm. You're trying to cause them to think. And I'm smart enough to know that I've talked to a lot of people that I didn't cause them <laughs> to think at all. Maybe they thought, when's he going to quit? But boy, if you can get a person to say, you really made me think, and, and wow, I, you know. That becomes sort of scary. It happened the other day. A guy said, uh, he said, Chief, I don't have a question. I just want to say, listen to you. He said, thanks. I needed that. He said, I really need it today. He said, this has been great. I just want you to know I needed this. 
And what do you say? I said, thank you. That means a lot to me. That means a lot to me. That, that you had that uh, influence over someone. Mm -hmm. Because you treat people as, as equal as, and you're fair. I, uh, when I was a chief, I, <clears throat> I was at Kelly Air Force Base when it was an active base. I said, okay, who's got a question? And a three-stripe airman raised his hand. He said, when do we get privacy in the dorm? He said, I'm three to a room in a crowded room. Uh, when, when do we get privacy? When do we get our own room? And I said, that's my number one issue. I said, I work that every day. And I said, we're going to work that. The day will come. Uh, I said, I can, I can only tell you that uh, we are on top of that and trying our best to arrange that. And I thought, uh, pretty good answer. And he said, he said, uh, I'm disappointed, Chief. He said, you're Mr. Big and you come out from the Pentagon and you give me the same stupid answer that everyone else has given me. He said, I thought you could do better. He attacked me. He verbally attacked me. He said, I thought you could do better than that. I'm disappointed. Wow. I said, okay, I'll tell you what. Ask me the same question again. He said, what? I said, ask me the same question again. He said, okay, when do we get privacy in the dorm, our own room? I said, next Monday. I said, do you like that answer better? He said, yeah. I said, it's a damn lie. <laughs> I said, would you rather I come on here and lie to you or tell you the truth? He said, well, probably the truth. I said, okay, go back to answer number one. <laughs> so <laughs> what do you do? You can't be all thing to all people. You know, it's nice. Wouldn't it be nice if you could go around saying, oh, what is your wish for the day? Your wish will come true tonight. Yeah, that'd be nice. Did you know Chief Bass told me the other day that an airman emailed her and asked if he could wear a kilt to work? A kilt as part of the uniform. What would you say? Sure, have an Air Force blue kilt made up. Sure, you can wear it. No, you would say, come on, you gotta be kidding. No, you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't be all things to all people. And if you try to be, you'll get frustrated. So mm -hmm. you, you go back to honesty. Mm -hmm. You go back to honesty, like the they should have done when the corona hit. You should have said, guess what? None of us know what to do. It's totally foreign. We're going we're gonna to try our best to get answers right now. Nobody, instead of blowing smoke at us and telling us one thing and then the next day telling us something else instead of saying, we don't know. Well, we're sure trying to find out. <clears throat> okay. So, sir, my uh, last question for you is you have had a remarkable journey since you first entered the Air Force in 1948. Your picture is hanging up just about every base, any heritage museum you go through. You're still speaking to Airman Leadership School, all the NCOAs. What do you ultimately want your legacy to be in the Air Force? Oh, I think I've uh, fairly well addressed it, that he was uh, funny. I am funny. And uh, that he was honest, that he was open, that he uh, wasn't afraid to admit he, he didn't know. He was a student of leadership. I am a student of leadership. Mm -hmm. I'm still okay. looking for the answer, uh, what do effective leaders do? A friend of mine, Bo Purrier, wrote a book titled 19 Stars. And in the book, he studied the leadership styles of four very famous generals, Marshall, MacArthur, Eisenhower, and Patton. And 
their stars totaled 19, five, 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 and four. Patton had four. The other three had five. And I asked Bo, uh, Bo Perrier, I said, after you researched uh, uh, for the book, what did the, those four great leaders have in common? And he said two things. Number one, they never, ever, ever, ever lost sight of their goal, their purpose, their reason for being. And number two, they were totally different in how they achieved that goal. What a great, great thing. Totally different in how they achieve. So each person has got to develop and bring their own style. And that's what Joanne Bass is doing now and General Brown. And that's what Tom Barnes did. He brought Tom Barnes to the position. I brought Bob Gaylor. Uh, Jim McCoy brought Jim McCoy. Uh, and, and, you know, when we're together, the 11 of us retired, we don't agree on everything, but we communicate the disagreement. And sometimes I say to him, yeah, I like your thought better than mine. I never thought of that. That's good. So we have the maturity that we're comfortable doing that instead of saying, no, I'm always right. If you don't let me be right, I'll take my bat and ball and go home. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. So I don't know. I, I just think uh, uh, fair play. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, Carol came to me last March and said, uh, Dad, uh, Trey is, uh, her son, Trey works at USAA, a uh, LSU graduate, as is his brother. He's a bright fellow. And uh, Carol and Trey said to me, Dad, we think you ought to go on Facebook. I said, what, what's that? <laughs> uh, well, you can do a weekly talk. I said, what would I have to do? He said, just talk. I said, well, I can do that. So on what April, I did my first, uh, my first Wednesday with the Chief. And here I am a year later, and I'm getting invites. I'm looking at my calendar. I've got Elmendorf, Alaska on the 11th. I got uh, uh, Wright Patterson on the 18th. Here I am, I'm getting more coverage than I did live. So through the magic of high tech, uh, my God, I'm 90 year old guy, <laughs> still doing his thing. And the good Lord, I, I think I've dazzled you with recall. I remember names and dates and places. Yeah, I- It's amazing. I don't make those up, those, um, uh, those, they're just there. I've got a head. I can answer most Jeopardy questions. Uh, I'm not the brightest bulb in the closet, but I have great recall. Yeah, <laughs> I tell you anything about the Air Force probably for the last 72 years. <laughs> this, it, you were just talking about the social media piece. And I mean, we're allowed to have this opportunity with you here today. Uh, thanks in large part to that. Uh, sir, you have taken uh, an incredible amount of time to, to be here with us. Pearson, do you have any last uh, comments, last questions for Chief? I don't have any questions, Chief. The only thing I'd like to say is uh, thank you. It's truly been an honor. Um, the big, I mean, everything was great. I could probably sit here and talk to you all day. Um, I, I wrote, I've been writing down ever since <laughs> this began. Uh, but I circled one that you kept, um, you kept mentioning and the, the fact that uh, you're honest and you lead by honesty. So I put down here leadership by honesty. I think that would be your AKA well, is how I, honest you are. So yeah, I, I think uh, I consider myself an honest person. And, you know, somebody asked Abe Lincoln, what is the greatest singular leadership trait? And he surprised everyone by saying humility, humility. Mm. And he said, let me make sure humility is not acquiescing or giving in or weakness. He said, humility is the confidence you have in yourself 
to know that you don't always have to be right, uh, but that your decision was based on your best knowledge and ability. And so I'm humble. I'm Bob Gaylor from Mulberry, Indiana. People say, what's it like having an academy named after you? I said, it's a tremendous honor. But when I go to Mulberry, Indiana, my old buddies uh, that I went to high school with aren't too impressed because first, they don't even know what an NCO Academy is, so they don't <laughs> care. When I tell them that, they go, oh, way to go, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> so they bring me back down to earth. One time I came home from a talk and Selma, when she was living, said, how'd it go? I said, one guy suggested I was awesome. She said, don't forget awesome and awful sound a lot alike. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, I don't think he said awful, but you made <laughs> me think maybe he did. Maybe he said I was awful, and I thought he said awesome. So but what the heck, you know, you give it your best shot and uh, let the chips <laughs> fall where they may. Well, I'll tell you one thing. You're both very bright. Thank you. And, and I will say this. If you've enjoyed this as much as I have, you've really enjoyed it because I have a blast. You can see. My gosh, the time, we've gone uh, over two hours and uh, it just flies by. I could do this, I could do this all day. And, and I so appreciate Carol being here with me and, and setting all this up. I've enjoyed it uh, and I thank you so much. And, and I hope that you uh, get some use out of our time together. I hope oh, yeah. to uh, someday shake your hand. Absolutely. I'm my That's shot Thursday, by the way, I'm getting my shot. Well, there you go. Okay. There you go. Yeah, I'm scheduled for Thursday, so next time you see me, I'll be immune. <laughs> Pearson, Pearson is probably going to be at Tyndall when all this. And hopefully um, living. Yeah. Yeah. He 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 should be at Tyndall when all this passes over, and I will be at Maxwell for the next couple of years. So I, I always hesitate to go to the Air Force Museum at Wright Patrick because. Every time I go, the curator wants to stuff me and put me on display there. <laughs> you know, so I, I told him, I'm not coming back. Cause they <laughs> yeah, here we see an old chief. And I said, no, I'm not ready for that yet. <laughs> Maybe someday they will. I'll, I'll be on display at, like at Spang Dollum. Like Spang Dollum, I was going to say, like your uniform at Spang. There. Oh, I met, yeah, I knew him when he was living. Oh, yeah, that guy. <laughs> I, I was actually over here. Be safe and good luck to you. Yes, sir. I was over here taking notes too. And I, the one thing that really stood out to me that I just want to say thank you for is uh, I have a lot of people asking me, you know, they're, they're transitioning and having tough times and new jobs, new careers, but just be yourself. And I, I can definitely say just from sitting here talking to you, you are yourself. You don't try to be anybody else. Very authentic uh, so I thank you for that. And for, I mean, this felt very relaxed, which was, you know, you, if you had told me five years ago, I'd be talking to Chief Gaylor. I would be like, oh my gosh, but it was just super relaxed feel. So one, one lady paid me a nice compliment. She said, you made me feel like we were sitting in my living room and just you and I were talking. That, that's yep. a nice compliment. That's exactly yeah. how this felt. Exactly I how this think, felt. Uh, uh, the word's been used. I'm folksy. <laughs> folksy. <laughs> yeah, so among my other things, I'm folksy. <laughs> well, folksy. sir, I can't thank you enough for this time. Um, thank you, Carol, for setting all this up for us. And uh, folks, that is going to conclude this episode. Thank you so much for joining us here for the Shadows Podcast.